people do what they do. So I'm happy to know that you're I'm happy to know what you do. And um actually, you know, speaking of that, let I was thinking let, let's kick off our conversation here, Andy. The the, the intention of which is like the, the reason why I reached out to you is is because someone on Twitter wanted to see a discussion on why ratios and how to use them for investing. And since I'm learning how to do that myself and I use some of them, but I, I don't think I'm taking the full advantage of ratios. I wanted to talk to you. So, but maybe you can give me a, an overview of, of what ratios are to you and, and how and why they help you be a better investor. Does, does that make sense? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, so the way that I view ratios, it tells you a whole bunch of information in, in one little snippet. So if you were to go to the grocery store and you're going to buy a can of beans, how would you evaluate if you're getting a good deal? And almost anyone that I know of and what I do is I'll say, okay, it's the dollar per ounce. And it's like, all right, well, how do I get the best value? You're going to look at the lowest dollar per ounce of a can of beans that you're going to buy. And you're probably going to get some large, you know, large can or a large, larger thing of cereal to get your best dollars per ounce, the best value. So the way that I basically look at investments, and this is across the entire board, and I don't know of another way to actually value assets or investments uh, because everything is relative. It's all, everything's relative in, in life. You want to go after um, what I would say is the best value and it's relative to everything else that's out there. And we have these things priced in paper currencies. Paper currencies, in my opinion, you can't value it because the currencies are going all over the place in terms of their own value. So you're, you can't measure a, an asset in something that is completely unstable. So you don't, you don't get a reliable indicator, so to speak. You don't know what the actual value of that asset is if you have an unreliable measuring stick. So what, what I do and what I like to do is you measure two assets against each other and compare it to history. And history will tell you through that ratio if something's overpriced or overvalued versus something that's underpriced or undervalued. And when you look at this over time, and you can do all these different ratios, you can use whatever you want. You can price money supply against gold. You can do gold against silver. You can do oil against gold. You can do whatever asset against whatever asset. What it's doing is if you look at history, you price these two assets against each other, it will tell you the limitations, the human limitations of what something, what humans are willing to pay at, the, at a top end price and what they're willing to pay at a bottom end price. So you're basically gauging what are the limitations that humans have put in the past against the asset valuations against each other. Mm -hmm. Now, if you just stick to the undervalued assets that you find in these ratios over time, and you, have, and you collect in your portfolio a group of undervalued assets, then you continue to buy undervalued assets and wait for them to become overvalued over time. What you're doing is you're, you're buying assets that are cheap against other assets, will, which will eventually buy more other assets in the future, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think it does make sense what you're saying here to, you know, stick mm -hmm. to those ratios and, and, and to those valuations, you know, buy something when it's cheap, sell it when it gets expensive relative to, to the other asset. But then you have to be looking at ratios that, that actually work because you, you have ratios mm -hmm. that do and ratios that don't work, right? That, it's what I'm guessing. But so maybe, do, do you maybe have a couple of examples of ratios that do work and, and maybe even a couple of examples of ratios that don't work? Yeah, uh, I can show you ratios that do work because I don't know of any that, that don't because um, yeah. unless, you might not have data like Bitcoin to gold or something where you don't have the data. I don't know if, it, if that would necessarily work because you don't have the history on it. But uh, I'll show you some ratios if I can share here uh, of, of things that, that, that do work uh, and that I do use. So here is, here's a ratio, um, one that has great interest to me. Uh, this is the commodity index to S&P 500 ratio. Uh, and what this is showing you is the commodity index divided by the S&P 500 and what it prints out. And to be honest, the scale is irrelevant on the left. What we're looking at are basically the outer boundaries of when we could potentially buy and sell. Uh, so over time, this ratio, uh, it's cheap when it's down here, meaning that 
commodities are cheap in relationship to stocks. It's expensive when it gets above, say, six. And that's just, you can put whatever limitations you want for buy and sell points on it for this valuation. What we're looking for in ratios are limits. So we're looking at limits. And, and a limit here, if you were to look and just scan your, your eyes across, you say oh, there's about a limit about two and below would be a good buy point for commodities. And if you looked at above, you'd say about six and above would be sell points just by looking at the outer limitations of each. And what we notice is we've got these green circles down here, which are buy points for commodities. And then we've got this massive low uh, recently here in 2020, 2021 in the ratio where commodities have not been this cheap ever in relationship to stocks. And what this is also telling us is it's telling us how money has flowed over time. The money has flown into stocks and not into commodities. This can gauge your sentiment. It can gauge your risk reward because your risk, your risk here is pretty low because you've never seen a valuation lower than where it is today. And your upside and how these assets have usually been priced in history is way up at around six or seven or eight and maybe even nine if it gets out of, out of whack. Uh, so this is kind of the, the bullish sentiment up here. This is your bearish sentiment on the bottom. So what we're identifying here is that we have an anomaly in history where commodities have not been this cheap into stocks. And it also means that the ratio of how money has flown into stocks versus commodities has never been so out of balance. Another thing that it shows is that your risk reward has never been so great in commodities. You've got low downside risk and massive valuation runway ahead of you for this to appreciate given the right market conditions. And mm -hmm. if, I, if I can move here real quick, uh, I also have a chart here uh, showing you the real-time update of this. So this is the real-time update uh, for the CRB index to S&P 500. And what I want to show, it's just a simple downtrend line. That's all it is. Uh, we've been downtrending, downtrending, downtrending. The ratios got to very low levels. And a ratio doesn't tell you anything about timing. It just tells you sentiment. If something's cheap, it doesn't tell you when things are going to rotate. And that's kind of where I use my technical analysis. And this is just a simple downtrend line that we have broken here in 2021, signaling that we could potentially move higher. Now, I'm just going to zoom in one last time on the right-hand side here and show you that this is that downtrend line. We have a simple pattern. It broke that pattern to the upside, signaling that we are in a new uptrend for this ratio where commodities will most likely outperform stocks going forward, given just the simple technical analysis there. Hmm. Okay, I like that. I like that it's simple. And you, you just said that mm -hmm. you don't know of any you don't know of any ratios that don't work, but I might. And I, uh, I might have a story about that. I, I told you a little bit about it off mic, but now I don't know if you've seen it or not. I hope not because it was a bad video. But so I made a video going over different ratios, you know, as I, I made this spreadsheet that um, that was meant to tell me what's cheap in the markets and what's expensive. And so I went through key moments in history. So, you know, think inflationary periods uh, like the 40s and the 70s, I believe I had on there, but I also recorded, um, so I recorded the price of different things, different commodities and the level of some indicators um, at important economic moments, I want to call it, like the dot-com bubble, 2002 bottom, 2007 top, 2009 bottom again, and so on and so forth. At those, just to see what the extremes were. And so I did that for many physical things like gold, silver, oil, but also for things like the M3 money supply, the price of the average home, the Fed's balance sheet, the total market cap of the, of, of the stocks in the US, I believe even crypto for fun. Obviously, that's not, there's not enough history on there. But so with all of these, I made ratios. I believe 10 or so things that I traced that the, the levels off during those significant periods, I made ratios between them also. Um, so, you know, each and every one of them with each and every other one of those. And so I recorded the highest ratio um, for the uranium to the Fed's balance sheet, so that the the, the, the highest that that ratio has been. Um, and I also recorded the, the the lowest and the average, right? So then, based on that, I I was I was thinking like, okay, so what would be 
a price for uranium if we ever go back up or down to that ratio? And what, what is it going to be if we go to that average? And so there, was, there were some reasonable suggestions like, um, you know, what if we return to the average, go to silver ratio? Well, then silver should be, let's say, I don't remember the exact number, but let's say 52 bucks, for example. But so for some things, like, for example, the ratio of uranium spot price to the Fed's balance sheet, well, if we were to return to the, the best that ratio has been uh, for uranium, then the uranium price should be, val- then, then, then uranium spot price should be at around $1,200 per pound. And that's what I came up with. So why I'm telling you this very long story is because that just got me thinking, how do I know these ratios are or are not reasonable? Like, when does the ratio matter? So like, Andy, you, you know, you, you use a lot of ratios on your channel as well. You've likely thought about that a lot more than I have. Clearly, you're smarter than me. So tell me, how, how do I know which ratios really matter and which don't? Well, the ones that I use are the ones that are kind of well-known. So uh, I think more well-known the ratio is, the more that people are looking at it the same, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. So the more people that are looking at what you're looking at, uh, it's going to have a little bit more validity because other people are also looking at it. So uh, the ones that I use uh, mainly are asset against asset, which are like a gold to oil ratio. So gold is used in a lot of ratios. Uh, they call it the gold standard or the gold measuring stick. And that's why you want to use it as in your ratios. Uh, and gold is that accounting me- mechanism for what you just did in your um, uranium calculation. So you just basically bypassed gold and went straight to uh, the money supply. But gold is, is that accounting mechanism. So when I say something like a gold to uranium ratio, uh, people will say there's no relevant correlation between gold and uranium. Yeah. And, and most people will say that, but there is the correlation because you just made that correlation directly. Uh, gold is correlated to the money supply and how it accounts for money in the system during certain market conditions. And uranium gets revalued under those same market conditions that gold does. So the ratio basically tells you market sentiment and the limitations given history of how uranium has been priced in relationship to gold or how uranium has been priced in relationship to the money supply. And all that is, is people changing their preference or changing because the interest rates and this is how it ties to market conditions. When interest rates go up, it puts pressure and pain on people in certain assets. Mm. And the ratios will start to change based off of those market conditions. So the pain point and, and people are, I'll just kind of make this in, as a general statement. People are kind of lazy. They're going to leave their investments, do what they're going to do until they have to change it. Yeah. Until they feel pain. And most people like large money, They'll leave their, their dollars in bonds or whatever. Uh, and when interest rates are going down in a 40-year bull market for bonds, it's a fair market for interest rates, um, they've made money in bonds. But when this, this interest rate, if we have inflation, which puts pressure on interest rates to go up, and that interest rate were to go up, it's going to put pressure on bonds to sell out and change these ratios that we're looking at. So look, go, go, tying it all back to what ratios are important and which ones are not, um, I would find a relevant ratio that people are using. You can find it online. And if people are using ratios for the most part, I would say that's probably a good one to use because other people are also looking at it Mm. and basing investment decisions off those ratios. So whatever you can find kind of out, out in on the internet, I would say if, and it's a ratio and you can find charts on it pretty easily, I would say those are the most valid because those are the ones that are being used the most. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Kind of like technical analysis and, and chart patterns. You want, you want, or so I'm told. I'm, you know, my understanding of technical analysis is not better than that of my chair. But so I'm told that you need to look for well-known patterns, broadly used, obvious things that are obvious to many people. Which is why, for example, maybe maybe I'm wrong to think about it that way. But so the example of a can of beans to the dollar ratio, because that's what it is. You know, when you see a price in, in the mm-hmm. store, that's what it is, right? It's a ratio of that good yep. to the dollar. And so whenever there's like a 25 or, a, you know, a one plus one deal, meaning a 50% discount, 
a lot of people will go ahead and grab that can because they can obviously recognize that that's a good deal relative to to the value of the U.S. dollar. Um, but it's you know obviously the U.S. dollar is something that a lot of people, three hundred and whatever thirty million people, look at and and use on a daily basis. Um, so I guess that's that's when it makes sense. Yeah, I like it. I'm starting to better understand this. Uh, but so so just to recap here though, Andy, uh, I want to make sure I'm getting you really correctly. You're not saying use ratios as a buy or sell, sell signal directly, but more use use ratios to figure out what's cheap and what's expensive. Buy what's cheap and sell what's expensive. Is that, is that it? Well, yeah, so you I, you can use it as a buy signal uh, because what it's telling you is your risk reward, and if that makes sense. So over time, you're going to have these assets that fluctuate against each other. If an asset is incredibly cheap, it's cheap in relationship to all the other assets. So if I were to ask you the question, why do you invest? And your answer as an investor shouldn't be to make money. It should be to make purchasing power gains. Now, if you're going to make purchasing power gains, what are you making the purchasing power gains against? You're making it against other assets. You want to buy other assets. So the asset you buy has to appreciate against other assets for you to buy more of other assets. Is that mm -hmm. a fair statement? Yeah. And um, yeah, I think so. I think, I think also that, for example, I've, I've talked to yeah. Lynette Zhang. Um, as well, and that, that's what she says, you know, um, for example, in some certain times in history, uh, an ounce of gold can, can buy you a city block or something like that, because, it, mm -hmm. you know, it, it helps you increase your purchasing power. So what you're saying, no, it does make sense. So the, the, the really good question there that you just uh, commented on is Lynette Zhang said um, that buying an ounce of gold could buy a whole bunch of different real estate. The question that that investor should be asking then is, at what market conditions does that present itself under where gold can buy a lot more real estate? When does that time happen? Because mm -hmm. that's when you that's the valuable question that I think a lot of uh, investors should be asking. And that's kind of how, why I developed the channel is to identify how humans interact with each other. And what what happens is they leave basically they, they put their print on technical chart patterns and say, this is what we're doing and how we're interacting with each other. They, you can verify it through the ratios in terms of your relative values. And real estate, in my opinion, is the driver of how people, the, the, the leading driver or leading indicators of how people are interacting with each other and how money is going to eventually flow between these assets. Mm. Hope that's a lot there. <laughs> no, 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 it does make sense. And I'm hoping we can touch upon <clears throat> exactly that and like a more practical example um, of real estate a, a little bit further on. What I'm thinking though about ratios is that, you know, ratios are a form of relative valuation. And then you also have options and, and, and absolute valuation. So that's not, we're not, and fundamental analysis also ties into that. But so we're not talking about that. And so in the end, you know, a ratio tells you whether something is cheap or expensive relative to something else. And, and that's something that I've thought about and, and, and kind of have a problem understanding, I guess. If I'm looking at a gold to silver ratio of like 100, and let's say 120, that tells me that gold is, gold is expensive relative to silver, meaning silver is the buy in this scenario according to that ratio. But that's not necessarily true on its own, right? Because we can have 120 gold to silver ratio even if silver is at $100, that would mean that gold is at like uh, what uh, twelve thousand, twelve thousand dollars, right? Then you have the, the one hundred and twenty gold to silver ratio, and so it shows us that silver is cheap and the cheaper metal of the two, but it could be a misleading indicator, uh, telling you to buy silver after it already being really high and you know far above the incentive price for new production and expectations, for example, and far above historical averages. So how do you solve that? Like, do you use different ratios, or how does that work, Andy? Yeah. So what you do is you look at a whole bunch of different assets priced against each other. So it would be not just gold to silver. It would be palladium to silver, platinum to silver, um, real estate to silver. You could do all these different ratios. And what's going to kick out if you do a whole bunch, um, if you're looking for undervalued ones, is you, you pick and choose all the undervalued ones in relationship to all the other assets. Mm -hmm. Then you start tying in other uh you would look at other things like cost curves, for example, you brought up cost curves. Um, if you have a cost curve 
and let's say it's platinum. I'm going to choose a very cheap asset. Probably one of the cheapest assets that I know of on a ratio basis is platinum. Uh, platinum is cheap in relationship to any asset that I can price it against. So then I would look at the cost curve and I have a cost curve here. I can show it real quick uh, just to touch on it. And I can show you uh, uh, the, the I'll, I'll show you the whole gamut on platinum because platinum is an incredible value. And we can we can look at some of this stuff. Um, Please do. Yeah. As, as, a, as a group. I'll start with this real quick. Uh, this is the gold to monetary base ratio. This is a ratio. Uh, and what this is signaling here is gold is very cheap in relationship to the money supply. So whatever you price against gold is going to be cheap against the, the monetary base. So the first thing that I just wanted to touch on, because I'm going to do platinum to gold ratio, is that gold is cheap in relationship to the money supply. And the one thing I wanted to touch on here is the revaluation occurs under certain market conditions, which ties into real estate. That's all I wanted to say. And this gets revalued when real estate goes, goes up under inflationary environments. Going to the platinum, uh, I'll go right to, I've got a lot of stuff here. Uh, this is the platinum chart. This is not a ratio, it's the platinum chart, dollars per ounce. Um, we've got the, the chart pattern here. It broke to the upside. We're doing a retest move, which is a very common thing when you break a large descending wedge type pattern. Uh, it bro breaks out, it does a retest, and it could even come back a little bit more before moving higher. But the interaction of humans with each other are signaling that a large pattern's here. Um, hopefully I put the, the ratios in here. Uh, for people to see for platinum, because I had some. Yeah, sure, sure. Do do and, and something that you said that I wanted to sort of comment on mm -hmm. is that you said platinum is cheap relative to any go. asset that I could value it against. Doesn't mm -hmm. that mean that you should only use ratios on comparable assets? Because I know that's the thing. You know, if you if you use the price to free cash flow ratio, for example, for dividend payers, you should do it on comparable companies. I guess this is also what I wanted to ask you previously, but I'm kind of slow that way. So I forgot, what do you, what do you consider comparable assets? Like do all commodities fall in the same bandwagon or do you separate them in energy, industry metals and so on? Because now you're doing gold to platinum. That, that makes sense because they're both precious metals. But would you do platinum to copper, for example? Yeah, you, you could. You very well could. Um, you can do any investable asset that you can put money and you can put it against any inve other investable asset. And if you have enough history, you can see how they interact with each other. Uh, okay. So it is very loose. There's no tight guidelines here. It's very loose. And if you have enough data and history on it, you can use it so long that it's reliable. Okay. And that, it, that it's basically trading in a channel or a band. If it's all over the place, uh, you probably don't have a good correlation. You probably don't have a good buy or sell signal uh, or valuation metric. Uh, and most of the time, you're going to find that they're they're in a channel over time, almost for almost for all the assets. If you go over a long enough period, uh, platinum, I think it's probably been produced since the late 1800s. So you've probably have data all the way back to that roughly that time frame. Uh, so you can you can use these this ratio uh, platinum against whatever um, against all these different assets. And if gold's cheap to the Dow Jones Industrial, then that means that. If platinum's cheap to gold, it just becomes a kind of a an IQ game or like one of those IQ tests, like a like straight logic. It just becomes okay if if gold's cheap to all this, the money supply to stocks, and then you can price all your other assets against gold. Then you know that those other assets are all incredibly cheap against stocks, monetary base, and whatever else there is. Now, platinum is incredibly undervalued. Uh, in relationship to history and in relationship to all of the other metals. Uh, in 2016, rhodium had a very similar setup. In 2009, palladium had that same setup. And rhodium in, in 2016 was priced at $650 an ounce and ran to $30,000. Huge run. Palladium was, was under $200 in 2009 and ran to $3,000. Now, I'm talking about rhodium and palladium because they are also platinum group metals. This is platinum and it's obviously a platinum group metal. And this guy has been left out. The, the Dieselgate scandal with Volkswagen, 
Uh, it really impacted the demand for it. Uh, and platinum is a substitute for palladium in catalytic converters and in other things that they use it uh, in life. It just takes a little bit of design work uh, for that. Mm -hmm. But looking at the ratios here, this is the platinum to gold ratio. Uh, we're at 0.5, which is incredibly cheap in relationship to history. Back in 2000, uh, early 2000s, it was at a ratio of about 2.3. So there's times in history where platinum is priced two times the price of gold. But right now you can buy it for a half ounce of gold. So it, let's say you want to invest and you want more gold. You could buy platinum at 0.5 uh, the price of gold, ride it to somewhere like a, a, a two ratio in the future eventually and swap your platinum for gold and get four times your gold, mm. if that makes sense makes sense. Yeah. Then yeah. we've got another ratio here, the platinum to palladium ratio. Um, palladium back in the mid 2000s was priced above five. So that means one ounce platinum could buy more than five ounces of palladium. Right now, palladium can buy two ounces of platinum, signaling that this ratio where platinum has never been cheaper in history against palladium. And platinum is a substitute for palladium. So eventually this ratio will work itself out uh, over time if you're patient. And then uh, okay, got... I like that. This actually reminds me of something and I'm, I'm being interrupted if I know that. I don't mean to be disrespectful, so, no but I'm just coming up with questions. Th this reminds me, I like the platinum and palladium one because you see they're, um, you know, the substitutes for each other. I, don't, I didn't know that. I always thought that, you know, platinum... Platinum is for diesel vehicles, and then or, or palladium is for diesel, and then platinum is for gasoline. Something along those lines for the catalytic converters. But so a, a ratio basically tells you tells us two things, right? So so um, and I'm I'm going to get to the point, but maybe to take an off road. Um, sticking with that example of go to silver ratio of, of 120 it tells us two things: a gold is overvalued relative to silver, and b silver is undervalued relative to gold. And so, you, you know, as you just said, and that's true, especially for commodities, everything moves in cycles. Mm -hmm. But if it's not platinum and palladium, who, which are substitutes for each other, as you said, who's there to say that the money that's flown into, you know, gold and has pushed it higher, which will, you see, you know, the money will inevitably flow out of gold eventually, because that's just the name of the game, cyclicality. But who's there to say that it, it will necessarily that it necessarily has to flow into silver or commodities or something else for that matter? Like, am I making any sense? Like, do, do you understand what I'm trying to ask here? So that, that's a great question, and that's why I have the three pillars, so to speak. The three pillars is valuations of ratios, and then market conditions is that other pillar, and technical analysis. Mm -hmm. um, market conditions determines how money flows. That's what's going to change your ratios. And what I tied into that is actually it's tied to real estate, which is then tied to inflation. And inflation is what moves interest rates. Interest rates determines where money flows. So if you have a certain market condition, it's going to favor gold over, say, platinum. Platinum is more inflation sensitive. Gold is less inflation sensitive and more uh, we'll call it more stable in low inflationary periods. So what happens is over time, depending on the market conditions, we have a high inflationary environment, platinum's going to outperform gold and that ratio is going to change. That money is going to, to, to flow into platinum more than even palladium and gold based off of the market conditions in history. So when you start to see these ratios change, uh, it tells you a lot more than what you think because if platinum's more inflation sensitive and you know that than gold, and that mm -hmm. ratio is starting to change and, and move, what it's telling you is if platinum's starting to outperform gold, we are entering an inflationary environment. And if you notice in 2008, we had that crisis where we went into a real estate crisis and our inventory levels got kicked way up, uh, home prices started to peak out, and then we crashed. Platinum crashed with it your inflation went away when that real estate market went away. And this was a recovery phase of real estate all the way from 2008, all the way down to 20, I'd say about 2018, 2019. And some of these, they, they don't 
exactly mirror at the exact time. They're delayed a little bit. We had a blow off bottom in 2020. We call it a capitulation bottom. Uh, a capitulation bottom means that everyone sold out. It was this lat, you know, that was the, the medical event that we don't want to talk about. It's the big blow off on the bottom. Then all of a sudden we're starting to see platinum start to outperform gold. And the ratio here tells us way more than what a lot of people think. Uh, it tells us market sentiment. It tells us what the market players are doing, what they're accumulating. It tells you money flows. It tells you risk reward. It tells you uh, valuation uh, between assets. And when you see these things start to rotate, you're saying the market is changing its sentiment against inflation because platinum is starting to outperform gold. And that capitulation bottom, usually you have a big sell-off at a top and then you got a sell-off at a bottom. So you have a, I should not a sell-off at the top, a, a, a spike at the top, a big blow-off top. And here's your, your blow-off top happened uh, right here uh, in 2008. This is big, large blow-off top, even in the ratio. This is, this is a ratio that we're looking at. We have this kind of blow-off top here. It's not huge because it's a ratio, but we were at very expensive valuation levels. Uh, over two is a very expens expensive platinum to gold price. Now down here, this is ridiculously low. I mean, this is off the charts low in compared to history. We could go all the way back into the 1800s and we haven't seen valuations this cheap of platinum in relationship to gold at 0.5. So what this is saying is that money has not flown into platinum and that if we are entering an inflationary period, and I'm sure you're seeing uh, CPI numbers and producer price index numbers going through the roof, um, this ratio will, it most likely will change. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's providing a very good risk reward valuation entry point uh, for platinum. And you can price this against any other asset. Uh, even against silver. And people have said that silver is one of the cheapest assets. Well, platinum is cheap against silver. Uh, it is incredibly cheap. And back in the, the early 2000s, platinum could buy 140 ounces of silver, and now it can only buy 41 ounces. Hmm. In history, at the, the peak of the 1980s, it's not on this chart here, we've seen uh, that ratio go just below 40. That's kind of the low end. And right now we are very cheap at 41 ounces for, for platinum. So uh, with the market conditions changing to an inflationary environment, we can maybe get into that if you want. Um, that's what's going to change these ratios. And the ratios are telling us that we could potentially be turning into an inflationary environment uh, given platinum's outperformance of, of palladium uh, and gold here in the, in the short term, breaking their downtrends. Mm -hmm. Okay. I like that. What you, what you just explained to me, because I was a little bit skeptical going into this because I was, it sounded a bit too easy. Like, you know, you just look at one ratio, you take a decision, that's it. But it's not that. I like that you're tying this into the broader picture, to macroeconomics. So you have your three pillars that I do, I absolutely do like. So I appreciate it. And it's, it's getting me to think though, that, that, you know, this, th these ratios, they tell you what's cheap. I mean, the, the, they, they, they can show you maybe which commodity is cheap or which market is cheap. Um, if you have that full set of maybe 15 or different commodities and you weigh them into each other, as you just said, and, and you know, make a gold to silver, gold to oil, gold, gold to everything. And then based on that, mm -hmm. you, you can see which one is cheaper. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to think further into that and how I might apply it more, more practically. Like, you know, you say you look at go to Dow and then you decide and go to everything. You decide gold is cheap relative to the Dow or in this example, platinum is cheap relative to all the other commodities, as you see. Then you look at the, the other pillar, which is um, the fundamentals, and you say money will flow into platinum. But to profit from it, you still have to pick the winning stocks to sort of leverage your bet on the price of the commodity, right? You, you, you can go for a portion of your portfolio. It could be you know, the, the physical platinum, but you still maybe have to pick explorers or developers or something else. So do, do you use ratios for picking individual investments, um, stocks specifically as well, Andy? Yeah. Yeah. So you, you could use ratios um, with like a platinum to a platinum producer and you could see that ratio. Uh, another one that's very well used is like the gold and silver index versus gold, the XAU or Huey to gold, that ratio, that one's used a ton by gold investors. So those, those would be used um, for investment. So the XAU 
to gold ratio would be the one that, that I would use. Hmm. Um, and what you, you don't have to use um, mining companies to gain leverage. That is a very risky way to play it. If you want to really de-risk your, your, your investment, you can invest in the physical metals and, and gain tremendous amounts of, of purchasing power without taking any risk. That's the lowest risk bet that I think you can make of any asset because it's not debt. It's no one, it's no liability. And you don't have management risk, jurisdictional risk. You have no risk. It, it is, you basically stripped all of the risk out of it and you're just playing the pure commodity price and ratio. Uh, and, and I know a lot of people don't favor it because it's not as easy. It's not as easy as logging into account and just buying stock because it's, it's free to buy stock now. It's super cheap. Uh, you can buy whatever. It's, it's easy. You can just click a couple of buttons and it's done. But if you use the physical metals and you can actually go to a dealer and swap these things, that is another avenue uh, reducing your risk uh, because metals don't care about inflation or deflation. What you care about is the number of ounces that you gain and the purchasing power against other assets. Uh, and I'll go, I'll run through an example real quick, real here, if you want me to, uh, sure. of palladium to silver to show you kind of how to do that with just physical metals. So this, this uh, example here is I just started randomly in 1998. And yes, I understand that I kind of chose the tops. So this could be a little bit more than what someone would do in, in real practical life. Uh, so you could maybe take a little bit off of it if you didn't time your purchases as perfect as this. But let's just say you buy one ounce of palladium at $200 an ounce. That's what the price was at this time. If you look at it in 1998, 1999. Um, so you buy one ounce for $200. Uh, you ride it all the way up. And at the ratio of 215, you swap your one ounce of palladium to silver. So that one ounce would then become, since the ratio is 215, it would become 215 ounces of silver. You would ride this ratio all the way over this next, you know, almost decade. Uh, and and palladium does palladium does very well in recovery phases of real estate. Silver does very well uh, in more inflationary type periods. And this was a this was a commodity bull market from 2000 to 2008. And silver outperforms palladium. So we were coming all the way back down. We swapped our palladium, our, our 215 ounces divided by 15, which is the ratio, gets you a palladium of 14 ounces. So in this 10-year time frame, which is the real estate cycle length, it's roughly eight, eight nine years, 10 years up, eight, nine, 10 years down, you, you gained 14 times your purchasing power. You went from one ounce to 14 ounces in 10 years. Name me a stock that's going to give you a 10x uh, in, in return during that time frame, with all the risk that you're going to take. This is a risk-free, I would, I would consider it to be the lowest risk uh, area to get a 10X without jurisdictional risk, without kind of the, all the taxes that some of these companies are subjected to, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you take your 14 ounces, ride it all the way up under this recovery phase of real estate and swapped it at the top here, which was another top, it's a double top here. And, and there was a big wick at the top as well. Uh, it's just cut off because I'm using the time frame. Silver, if you swap your 14 ounces at 170 ratio, you'd have a 2,380 ounces of silver priced at roughly $23 an ounce right now. It's worth $54,740. You put $200 in at 1998, 1999. So the return per annum is 27.5% or a total return of 273 times your money. I don't know of of that many investments that return this well over time where you have to speculate and take on so much risk when you can really not put too much risk here and get a 273 times your money, 273 bagger. Now, I only used in this, in this example, palladium and silver. You can use a whole bunch of different assets. You can use oil. You can use uh, rhodium. If I used rhodium, I, this would turn $200 into millions of dollars, millions. Now, I don't know of a single investment in terms of stocks that could do that. And what you're exploiting here and what you're learning is that when these ratios move against each other, you're increasing your purchasing power irrespective of inflation, deflation, or dollar valuations. 
Because right mm -hmm. when you saw this, I said nothing about dollar valuations except for the initial purchase price and what it's worth at the end. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know of another way to increase purchasing power as effectively without using ratios. Because mm -hmm. ratios tell you that value and what you're looking for is that movement of an asset against another asset and increasing your purchasing power when they move, if that makes sense. It does. It, it does make me think about some of the limitations of ratios, though, because you still got to you have to buy something that, you know, will be in demand. And so then we go back to the, one of those pillars that you said, like macroeconomics. Um, mm -hmm. But what, what else do you think are some of the limitations of that? Like are any drawbacks, any risks that you, you might have to account for with ratios? So ratios don't tell you timing. They just tell you if something's cheap. Uh, so it doesn't tell you when it's going to necessarily rotate. And that's where you're going to have to use technical analysis or tie it into market conditions um, or tie it to something else if you want to, to, to have it change quickly for you. Um, so you could be in an undervalued asset for a very long period of time. So your, your risk is your time in the asset. I, I don't think that, I don't know of too many things that are used as, 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 we'll call it materials or commodities that haven't rebounded. They've, I've almost, everything has rebounded over time, but the time in that investment would be your lost opportunity cost. Because if you're going into something that just got cheap, uh, platinum has been cheap for a while, but there's been no sort of spark to make that different, you know, to, to spur that rotation of money into platinum. I think platinum will do very well because of the inflationary market conditions that are coming ahead of us. And that's my viewpoint is that we're entering an inflationary uh, cycle. And it, it should be everyone's viewpoint if you're in commodities that we're entering an inflationary cycle, because if we're not, commodities are not a good spot to be in. So you have to be default in inflationary type um, paradigm or viewpoint. Uh, so your opportunity cost is where you could get hit with a ratio and it, and it can remain cheaper for a pretty long time that you got to under, I would say you have to understand how things, the catalysts for rotation for money to come into that. Now, if you chart out your ratio, you can also see that can be your timing. If you use technical analysis uh, to say the downtrend's broken, people are rotating their, their thoughts about this. The sentiment is changing. So, yeah. So if I were to, uh, look at some of this stuff. Um, technicals are fundamentals and fundamentals are technicals. They are, they are of the, the same ilk, so to speak. And I know a lot of people think that they're, they're completely separate. Um, what you're doing in a, in a technical chart or in a, even a ratio chart is you're looking at the, 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 we'll call it the, the imprints or the marks that the interactions people have against each other. Uh, they're leaving footprints. The footprint is what I'm looking at. And I'm saying, okay, they're changing their sentiment because you can see it in how these chart patterns and how humans are interacting with each other over time. So ratios can remain cheap for a long time. You're going to have to use technical analysis and or market conditions to see that rotation. Mm -hmm. So it's opportunity cost is what you lose. Okay. Yeah. And then you also, you got to make sure that you understand the underlying mm -hmm. commodity, I guess, right? Because you know, if you if you start going into some of these really niche things that you do not understand the supply and demand dynamics of, you might run into trouble, right? So, if if you use technical analysis, the supply demand uh, fundamentals on a long term chart are baked into the cake, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Your supply demand is changing your ratios. The supply demand is forming the patterns that they are forming. It's it's the interaction of people. So. Um, the reason something is going down versus basing out and then turning back up is based off of the market participants and their viewpoint on supply and demand. The most dangerous thing that I think you can do is think that you have fundamentals correctly uh, identified by yourself. So let's say I come up with an analysis and I say the supply demand fundamentals are X, Y, Z and X, Y, Z is good. So then you go and invest in it. Now, how do you know that the market has the same viewpoint as you do? That's where you get that, that, that 
difficult spot where it's like, how do you validate that my viewpoint matches the market's viewpoint? Now that's where the technical analysis has to come in. And anyone who's been in the markets for, I would say a very long time, you're gonna look at simple technical analysis at some point and say, the downtrend's broken. The market participants think that this is changing. So I, I think that you have to tie it all together. It's not just one or the other. Everything is tied together. The fundamentals tie into technicals and the technicals tie into the fundamentals. The ratios tell you what the fundamentals are. They are literally telling you platinum right now is down because the fundamentals of platinum are bad. Mm. And you have to buy when things are bad, not when they're good, because when they go to rotate from bad to good, you're in it. And you can identify that you're in it based off of the ratio. And if you do simple technical analysis, um, you could say, okay, this sentiment is definitely changing. The ratio is changing into a favorable mix for platinum. And we know that the, uh, that the platinum price is going to start to outperform other assets. Mm. So it's giving you a validation of what the market thinks as well by looking at changing ratios and the technicals. So yeah. if you have one piece of this, you'll be lost, so to speak. And that's why I developed my channel uh, and to try to educate this because it is somewhat complex. It's not super, it's not just we have a cheap ratio, I should buy the cheap ratio because you could be in it for a very long time and it remain cheap for a long time. But if you can see that you're below the cost curves of platinum, the cost curves of platinum is like the highest cost producers are about $1,000 an ounce. We are at $930 an ounce right now. So the high cost producers <clears throat> are cutting back on their production. If you can see that the ratios are starting to change against all of these other assets, what you're going to be in is most likely a, a, an asset that's going to outperform everything because your valuation runway to the upside is so great. Mm. So it's telling you risk reward. It's telling you how market participants and sentiment is, is in the market. It's telling you all of those things in just one, in, in, a, in, a, in a few ratios. Mm. And hope, yeah. hopefully that you can digest that. And, and, and there's a lot of, it's, it's a lot to think of. If, if you sit down and really start to try to break these ratios apart, it almost tells you everything in a snapshot. Hmm. Because if it's cheap against everything else, money is not there. It can't be there. Hmm. Money has flowed out of that sector. And that's how it became cheap against all other assets. And yeah. it also says that the market conditions for platinum are bad. And if market conditions are bad for platinum, and platinum does well under inflationary environments, it means that we, we came from a disinflationary or deflationary environment. And which, if you were to look back, you'd say, yeah, we came from a disinflationary environment. We were in a 40 year decline. And I can show you this real quick. I'll share it real quick here, just to show all the viewers something. We've been in a 40 year decline in interest rates uh, since 1980, all the way till uh, 2020. Uh, 2020, 2021, we're starting to come back up. Now, if th this is a huge market condition here in terms of the 10-year treasury rate, this is interest rates. This is interest rates declining over time. When this breaks this simple chart pattern downward, when this breaks the interest rate going up, when they taper and this interest rate goes up, what you're going to see is, an, is a complete paradigm change in everyone's outlook, because everyone's been living from 1980 in a declining interest rate environment. That is how they view everything. Uh, and when this goes up and we go into a potentially an increasing interest rate environment, and I don't know if they can do that, they may try to stop it uh, because they can't afford increasing interest rates. What, what it's going to do is it's going to rotate money into these other assets like commodities and precious metals. And it mm. could be the largest rotation that anyone has ever seen because we've been in a 40-year decline in interest rates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that does make sense. So and it, it actually ties into a conversation that I recently had with uh, Bob Moriarty about sentiment. You know, he's very big on sentiment and he always says that the market...